Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Defense Systems Information Analysis Center, or DSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. DSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the defense systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the defense systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the Defense System's DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD Defense Systems research. Well, good uh, morning, afternoon, evening to everybody who's joined in. My name is Brian Benish with the DSI. I hope you were able to uh, experience that little webinar intro video that we put together. Uh, came, a little through, came through a little choppy on my end, but I think that's because of my internet connection. So hopefully everyone else was able to, to see or at least hear it. Um, thanks for joining the uh, webinar presentation for today. Um, for those who are just dialed in, uh, I would recommend you go to the DSI website and find this webinar under a uh, webinar's webpage um, on that website. And there you will find a link to download the slides. So then you can follow along um, with the, the, the presentation as you can hear it just audibly. Um, for anybody who might be experiencing any technical issues throughout the presentation, um, be aware again, you can download the slides and, and dial in um, and, and experience it that way. Alternatively, we will be and are recording this presentation. So we will have that posted and available uh, to you later if you do get kicked out for any reason. Uh, for those who are in the any meeting platform online, I uh, want to just give a couple um, kind of house rules for what you're looking at. Uh, most important thing I want to draw your attention to is at the top middle of the screen is a little dialog box for audience questions. If you hover over it, it says something about audience questions. At any point during the presentation, if you have a question, uh, I'd encourage you to click that little button or that icon enter your question and it will be put into a queue. And then at the end of the presentation, we will go through those questions uh, in the order that they are received. Um, I do want to distinguish that from the attendee chat, which should be on the left hand side of your screen. Uh, that's a chat just that would go to us as presenters. You can come, you know, let us know if you're having any issues or whatever, and we'll, we'll monitor that. But if you have any questions you'd like us to address at the end of the presentation, I get encourage you to enter those in the audience question box, top middle of the screen. All right, um, I think that covers the, the bases there. Um, I will uh, not delay any longer. Doyle, I uh, will hand the, the remaining time over to you for the presentation and I will chime back in for Q&A at the end. So Doyle, the, the floor is all yours. Okay, as Brian said, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, I'm here with my colleagues, Megan Letha and Richard Piner. We put together a presentation which is based off of a state-of-the-art report we are in the process of producing with DSIAC right now about shielding against unwanted electromagnetic waves and electromagnetic interference. So, God willing, I'll be able to operate the slides here. There we go. So, just kind of an overview of what we're going to cover here. First off is, you know, unwanted EM waves, why should I care? Um, EM radiation basics. Um, sources of these different types of EM waves, ways we can protect against them, common current shielding materials, state of the art, but available shielding materials, and then upcoming EM shield materials, the type of things we're doing R&D in now that hopefully we can see deployed in the next round of different types of um, deployable weapon systems for the military. And then the ability to be able to access these different materials and material systems, because just because we have it 
on something doesn't mean we have enough of it to be able to use and deploy in mass quantities. So why should I care? Well, quite frankly, future wars with our near-peer adversaries, and in particular, we go back to China here, are going to be fought involving weapons that deploy a great deal of embedded electronics. These take the form of different types of GPS, navigation sensors, being able to contact satellite to make sure that it gets where it needs to go, being able to transmit information on what it's doing back to the operator, and being able to make sure that in general its status is good and we can assume that it will be able to do its job. The graphic kind of here on the bottom right kind of uh, hits home to that point. There's a lot of little symbols there showing stuff being transmitted from one place to another. For all these to work properly and consistently, EMI protection needs to be applied. Now, this doesn't just relate to exclusively the military domain. There is a great deal of civilian infrastructure that indirectly supports the military domain, allowing the military to be able to do its job. And so to that extent, we kind of focus on that a little bit in this um, webinar as well. That way we can kind of see the different areas here and what we need to do to be able to ensure that we're able to fight wars effectively and be able to win wars effectively. So basics here. So EM radiation is composed of a traveling wave of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. They're ubiquitous throughout today's world. They are governed by the wavelength and the frequency, and this decides how they interact with normal matter. The, pro the problems start to come into place when you have many different types of electronics operating within close proximity to each other. You start to see electromagnetic interference. This is the result of an unwanted wave being picked up at a receiver. So if you look at the um, bottom left here, there's four different things going on here. Reflection, absorption, diffraction, and scattering. Reflection is just absorbing, I'm sorry, reflection is just reflecting a wave off of a surface. Absorption gets a little bit more complicated. You can start to have scattering occurring within particles within a component. You can have diffraction off a surface. You can have diffraction within particles within a component. Or you can also just be absorbing material within the different pieces of that component. So absorption kind of encompasses a number of different things there. If you look at the right, you see a um, squished down version of the electromagnetic spectrum. The parts of it that we most often communicate over and include stuff from a very low frequency up to extremely high frequency is from the radio set up through microwave up to about 300 gigahertz. At that point, we start to transition to uh, infrared waves, which we commonly see as heat, visible light, which we see right now, and after that, ultraviolet. At Ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma ray, we start to have to protect ourselves against that because there's a lot of energy being carried by those higher frequencies, and you can start to hurt yourself with ultraviolet. That's a, that's starting to uh, get a sunburn. With X-ray and gamma rays, you're starting to talk about uh, damage to cells. So moving forward to the next slide, so you know where does all of this come from? Well, it comes from everything. Humans, cell phones, incandescent light bulbs, literally everything. There's a number of different ways to classify um, EMI and EM sources. So to start out with here, we're going to distinguish between them as natural and man-made. So natural EMI and natural EM sources, we're talking about on Earth, the lightning or auroras. If we start to move outside the Earth, where we're starting to be able to operate when you talk about um, things for NASA, Space Force, and the Air Force, solar flares come into play. Man-made, we start to talk about radios, cell phones, appliances, noise from computer chips. The list goes on and on and on, the Internet of Things. There's any number of things that can sit here and cause problems. And we have to be able to provide solutions to them. So, as mentioned, for an electronic device to interfere with another, it must be producing an electric field at a signal that's close to what's being picked up by the victim device. This is going to result in modulation, either amplification or reduction, constructive or destructive interference. Some notable examples of this that work and, be, and allow us to be able to visualize this are a radio crackling in the presence of a lightning strike. Um, sometimes electric motors turning on a call spikes in power lines and cause lights to flicker at our offices. If you're like me and you're a researcher, you sometimes find a noise in the electronic signals of your lab data and your signal to noise ratio goes to garbage. Another way we can start to break this down is, as I alluded to a second ago, is terrestrial versus extraterrestrial. Extraterrestrial, as we know it right now, is almost exclusively um, natural sources, minus any spacecraft that are launched that are still transmitting at specific frequencies. 
Terrestrial is a combination of both the terrestrial activities, I'm sorry, the natural activities going on on our on Earth, and then the numerous man-made activities that have started to crop up in the last century. So sources of EMI from an extraterrestrial perspective. Primarily the sources are solar or cosmic. So the primary source that we see in our solar system is the sun. It radiates in multiple forms in a broad spectrum from radio to gamma rays. Solar winds radiate EM via a stream of charged particles. They interact with the Earth's magnetic field. They can also produce solar flares. Cosmic sources are usually weaker simply as a result of they are much farther away. Cosmic radiation includes all of these different kinds of EM waves, and we often see charged particles coming out. These are a greater challenge in space than they are on Earth because they're usually filtered out by the Earth's atmosphere and the Earth's magnetic field. However, up there, you can't necessarily, you have to build in your own radiation shielding. Otherwise, you're going to experience damage to chips and the satellite won't work anymore. <clears throat> Next slide. So, sources of EMI on Earth start to get much more complicated. So, as you can see here, there are almost countless sources of EMI on Earth. Within the um, FCC spectrum that we broadcast on, we can talk about AM radio broadcasts, broadcast TV, FM radio broadcasts, cell phone signals, GPS, satellite radio, wireless computing networking, and satellite TV. As we're moving into the future, we started seeing a lot of 5G coming into play, so over a number of different bands, and this is enabling the Internet of Things. And in the future, we're going to start to see 6G, 6G become a thing. The FCC has granted a block of spectra from 95 gigahertz, 3 terahertz for 6G research that's eventually going to be parsed out amongst the different pieces of 6G technology. We, are, we do note that for 6G, it's not like 5G where you don't require a line of sight. You can be able to transmit through walls. 6G probably won't be able to do that quite as well if it can, but it's still going to be a source of EMI that we're going to have to deal with. So within this, there's also a number of intentional, in addition to unintentional, um, EMI transmitters. Unintentional might be the noise from a computer chip or an electric motor. Intentional starts to be things like uh, high-altitude electromagnetic pulse weaponry that could be deployed against us, um, x-ray machines, transmitters, these type of things that for some of them are going to be intentional but not necessarily directed to us as a weapon and in some cases intentional and directed towards us as a weapon and we need to be able to find ways to address both of these. So how do we protect ourselves from this? There's a number of different avenues that we can take that all kind of get married together. So the first of them is shielding and shielding is a design and a materials problem. So from this we're going to talk about that a little later. But first, we're going to kind of look at regulation and implementation, because these provide a baseline for shielding to kind of sit on. So regulation takes the form of various types of different standards. So there's the Institute for Electro Electrical and Electronics Engineers, that's IEEE. For all of us in the military, that's mil spec, mil handbook suggestions. For um, There's also the American Society for Testing and Materials, ASTM. And then there's a form of legislation or executive orders that kind of set the ground rules for a lot of these things and allow us to be able to operate all of this within our society. Then on top of that, we're talking about implementation. There's a many different ways to be able to marry physical protections and regulations that allow us to be able to protect civilian and military assets and allow the military assets to be able to do their jobs while being supported by the civilian assets. So regulation. The first line of defense that we have to protect from a military perspective are the defense critical industries. So that's going to include first financial services, this supports activities related to the appropriation of funds for the DOD. Second is transportation, the defense transport system. Third is gonna be public works. So we're talking about electric power, oil, natural gas, water and sewer, and then emergency services. Next is global information, command and control intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance and the facilities that support that, health affairs related to the healthcare infrastructure, defense personnel, and this includes defense and commercial industry support personnel, defense space infrastructure, controlling both space and ground assets related to the United States dominating in space, logistics, that's provisions of supplies and services to the DOD, and the defense industrial base. So this is DOD product and service providers from the private sector, i.e. me. From a legislation perspective, all of this is very, very, very complicated. There is no overarching piece of legislation. 
different pieces have been used to address different things. And oftentimes EMI gets lumped into things like cybersecurity. So what you see is there was some EMI work lumped into the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency Act of 2018. This went through and created the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency within DHS and is used to kind of be able to provide what is needed to be able to address all of these different industries to assure that they'll be there in a time of war to support the Department of Defense. Recently, within uh, fiscal year 2020, the National Defense Authorization Act allowed for some regu regulation involving electromagnetic pulses and geomagnetic disturbances. So work is being done on this. I think the answer from any expert is that work continues to need to be done on this so that when we find ourselves, because we will at some point in a war with an adversary, we need to be able to be armed and be able to take care of ourselves. So standards. So we're talking about this here. We've had dedicated an entire webinar to it. We've dedicated an entire SOAR to it. Designing for EM shield is not easy. Measuring shielding effectiveness is not always straightforward. Measuring effectiveness is done in the lab and with very specialized equipment. All of us know stuff that's done in the lab doesn't always work perfectly well when you take it into the field. So standards have been adopted by a number of different entities here. So we're talking about the military, IEEE, ASTM. The National Security Agency has its own set of specifications. The FCC, which monitors and controls the different commercial airwaves, have their own set of regulations. The American National Standard Institute has another set of regulations, and then there's many, many other international standards. And the reason I mention that is simply because international standards involve the operation of American military assets in other countries. We have to know what those are and have to know how to be able to work with and operate within those in countries we don't necessarily govern, but still find ourselves operating in. So talking about implementation from a civilian perspective. So building materials and construction philosophies. There's a lot of buildings made that support the military. These are guided by regulations and standards. You can turn building materials into EM and EMI shields. Filler materials can be added to drywall, plaster, the main construction materials with focuses being made to try and uh, essentially be essentially make this affordable for people to be able to do and it not cost a fortune so that it's adopted in large ways by society in general. In addition to that, you're kind of building in the different regulations and legislation that go into this and it, into the process of constructing new buildings. Telecommunications is a very big one. You're guided by regulations and standards. They address wired and wireless devices, civilian aerospace and civilian GPS. Greatest example I can think of of this that I'm sure we've all experienced is when the when the person comes on as the airplane is starting to taxi to the runway, we're all told to turn off our cell phones. That way we don't inadvertently cause EMI and result in a lack of communication between the pilot and the ground or something worse. Another example is the proliferation of drones that have occurred in the last decade. So I have here an example taken by TRI from an AFRO report inspecting some pieces of concrete from a drone. You can talk about hitting it with different forms of EMI to be able to disrupt its contact with its operator or be able to disrupt its operations altogether. Either way, you now have a drone just either flying or crashing somewhere, or you have a drone out in the, for a military case on a mission that's no longer able to do its job because communications has been severed. So now talking about some of the military examples for EM protection. So these are all guided by mil spec and mil handbook. The most, the most common of this is going to be GPS. We all need to know where we're going and how to get there. This is built into our planes. This is being built into weapon systems. This is being built into missiles, projectiles, all over the place. One you don't that can be thought of as an EMI problem is a heat-seeking missile and heat-seeking missile countermeasures. So if you're operating a heat-seeking missile, it's trying to go towards the greatest IR source that it can find, which is oftentimes either the exhaust or the engine section of some sort of an aircraft. You can think of EMI in this case as chaffer flares that's being put out by the aircraft that the system sees and wants to fly towards rather than flying towards the actual target. Bad. And then also future implementation of weaponized EM and EMI. This takes a number of different forms ranging from, you know, intentional jamming, um, something called spoofing, which was is believed to be the potential cause of the loss of an RQ-170 drone over Iran several years ago, 
non-nuclear electromagnetic pulse weaponry, um, non-explosive high power microwave warheads, which can both of which can be used to attack civil infrastructure as well as military infrastructure, enabling the civilian infrastructure not to be able to support military infrastructure, and then microwave attacks on personnel. <clears throat> Microwave attacks on personnel have been rumored to have been started along the China-India border by which a pulse of microwaves is sent out at some soldiers. The microwaves interact with the water in the outer layer of their skin, heat up their skin. They're unable to effectively fight at this point. So now you're talking about having to shield EM from on a soldier and somehow either building it into some kind of coating on a soldier like a face paint or within the textiles that they're wearing at the time. These are all problems that we have to address. <laughs> Other areas, electromagnetic pulses. An electromagnetic pulse is a surge of current that produces a very high voltage. High voltages allows different electronics to short and blow out and not function. This can be used purposefully as a weapon. Um, an example here is a Burke pulser from the US Army RDE -COM. What happens in one of these things is there's a piezoelectric crystal that's put on the barrel of a gun. A blank is launched, a blank is fired from the gun. The high pressure gas that would normally be pressing against a bullet now just travels to the piezoelectric uh, piece at the end of the gun, hits it, and a high voltage pulse is produced. So you can imagine these things being used to take down a drone, which now needs shielding from a high voltage pulse, all are being fired at a soldier to be able to incapacitate any electronics he may have on it. It's possible you could even turn this into a microwave weapon to be able to shoot at a soldier to incapacitate him. <clears throat> um, high altitude EMPs are another example of this. High altitude EMPs are a way to disable very large um, sections of infrastructure via detonating a nuclear weapon in the atmosphere or, de or um, disable satellites above it. So stealth is another example of something like this. So stealth works by a combination of reflecting and absorbing EM waves with different sets of materials. Um, there are many, many ongoing efforts within the materials community to be able to improve this technology, either via new technology, new materials, or combinations thereof. EM shielding is also a considerable deal within sensitive compartmentalized information facilities, so SCIFs. <laughs> So we're showing an example here of President Obama and the national security team during Operation Neptune Spear. When you think about the practicalities of this, you have building materials that are being made to make the floor, the walls, and the ceiling. And all of those have to be shielded. The doors have to be sealed. The doors have to be shielded. The seals around the doors have to be shielded. The seals around where the wires coming into the room have to be shielded. The wires have to be shielded. Everything has to be shielded. Undersea cables are another example. Um, this is how we send the internet across continents. This is how we transmit information in, in bulk. Upgrades to these are making it harder to tap into them, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't been done. Operation Ivy Bells during the Cold War allowed the United States to be able to eavesdrop on various Russian officials and get insight into what their plans were before they knew that we had any idea. It's something that needs to be considered. <clears throat> And another example is, of course, uh, satellite protection. Here we're talking about the next great field outside of the Earth. We're talking about spa the Space Force and the Air Force being able to operate in a, in a consistent and assurable way. There are several unique problems associated with EM shielding and satellites that don't necessarily take place on Earth. We no longer can claim the, all of the magnetic field and all of the atmosphere of the Earth as a way to be able to protect against different 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 damage sources. Cosmic rays and radiation, high energy particles and ionizing radiation are now a problem that have to be specifically dealt with. Magnetic storms from the sun have to be dealt with. Damage can occur from the Earth's own Van Allen radiation belts. And in addition to that, you need to be able to defend yourself against uh, high altitude magnetic, high, I'm sorry, high altitude EMPs associated with a nuclear blast. So, Beyond regulations and standards and legislation, defeat EMEVI turns into a materials and design problem and solution. From a material, there's lots of challenges with this, but first and foremost, as an EM wave has two components, there's an electric field component and a magnetic field component, and you can't necessarily, and you cannot defend against the magnetic field component. You can just do your best with it. The challenge also starts to arise when you bring the field frequency into play. So, just, just as a almost arbitrary cutoff here, 
Um, low frequency is considered DC, which is a static field, to about 10 kilohertz. High frequency is 10 kilohertz and up. And then in addition to this, we live in a dynamic world. The fields are all dynamic. Things change all the time. Shielding is hard. Shielding is difficult. But we have to be able to identify materials, systems, and identify designs that allow us to be able to address all of these things and still function in the environment that we need to. So most research and development for shielding materials is focused on the creation and study of new and more effective materials. This is particularly true for the high frequency range because a lot of these pieces of spectra that are being opened up right now are within the high frequency range, allowing things like the Internet of Things to proliferate. Most often, current commonly deployed commercially available materials are heavy, they're high density, expensive, inflexible, opaque, have supply chain issues, are susceptible to corrosion, and have low impact resistance. If I can just offer an example here, one is copper. Copper is heavy, copper is expensive, copper is not as flexible as a polymer, it is opaque, it has supply chain issues, it is susceptible to corrosion, and it has low impact resistance depending on the alloy that you're talking about. So, common EM shielding methods uh, can be broken down into, as stated, high frequency and low frequency. When you're talking about low frequency, Faraday cages are the most common thing. This is essentially a mesh of, me of metallic material, and you put whatever object you're wanting to shield against inside that mesh. They are cost effective, but heavy. And they're most often made using electrically conductive materials that provide good EMI screening. So we're talking about things like iron, nickel, cobalt, copper. High frequency, we now start to talk about material electronic electrical conductivity becoming the predominant factor that governs the ability to shield. So in general, the more conductive a material, the better it's going to act as an EM mirror to reflect a wave. And that's where we start to have to dedicate some of our research to. There we go. <clears throat> so now, looking at the state of the art for current materials. So there's, for this, we have things like ferrite-based materials. So, and these can include alloys of ferrite and manganese zinc, nickel zinc, stronium, barium, cobalt. These are used to make magnetic cores and devices requiring highly conductive materials. So transformers, antennas, and electric motors. Beyond that, we start to come to various different kinds of flavors of that. So one example is mu metals. So these are a blend of iron and nickel. They are a material that can be magnetized and demagnetized without much in the way of core losses and very quickly. These were first patented in 1923 to, as an inductive um, in load insert in submarine telegraph cables, kind of like what we were talking about earlier. The idea behind that, the impetus behind it, was that conductive seawater was adding an additional capacitance to these cables. So this was causing signal distortion as you're trying to send information from say America to Europe or back again. This was limiting bandwidth and signaling speeds to something on the order of 10 to 12 words per minute. So words per minute is primitive now, but back then state of the art. So mu metal was wrapped helically around these cables to be able to confine the magnetic field within them and greatly allow, greatly expand the ability of information to be sent from one place to another. <clears throat> on that word, another material that's been developed for that is met glass. Met glass is a thin amorphous metal ribbon. It's non-crystalline. It is made via a very rapid solidification process that allows it to have some very unique ferromagnetic properties, allowing it to be magnetized and demagnetized very quickly and with very low core losses. But as stated before, all of these are ferrite-based materials, which means they rust. They're susceptible to corrosion. And if you're talking about an electronic device, I can't tell you how many times I've dropped my cell phone. All of these have fairly low impact resistance. So what else do we have? We have carbon allotropes out there. So that's different forms of carbon that we can do all sorts of different and fun things with. These include things like graphene, carbon fibers, reduced graphene oxide, and flexible graphite. So Graphene, we hear a, we've heard a lot about that. It's been very popular in the research community. It was first isolated and characterized in 2004, and they found a way to be able to make monosheets of graphene since approximately 2013. It's a single sheet, it's a single atomic sheet of graphite. It's commercially available, but research is continuing in this. It's something that's not been able to be manufactured in the large quantities necessary to be able to have it take over the shielding requirements for everything everywhere. 
In addition, we're, lim we're limited in terms of the shielding effectiveness by the number of layers of graphene used. So carbon fiber, there's two different forms of carbon fiber that you can think of here. One is going to be um, carbon fiber reinforced polymer composites. These are the kind of, car these are long strings of carbon fiber that are reinforced in a polymer matrix. And this is the type of thing that a lot of aircraft manufacturing is moving towards. So rather than making it out of aluminum, they're not talking about making it out of carbon fiber. Another option is chopped fiber. So if you think of the type of material that boats are made of, this is a polymer with chopped fiber on the inside. The fiber isn't necessarily organized, but it is still there to provide reinforcement. Carbon fiber in both those forms can provide some degree of EMI protection. Uh, reduced graphene oxide is another example. This is another form of graphene. It is easier to produce than pure graphene, and it's used for a lot of the same things, but at the same time, it's a less perfect version of it. So you don't see it proliferating throughout the shielding community. Flexible graphite is another option. So this is um, used when a typical metallic is ineffective for um, sealing. And two examples of sealing are shown here on the side taken from a NASA paper. So this is sealing around different openings in the main body of a spacecraft being sent to Europa around Jupiter. So this is a unique problem because Jupiter has a gigantic magnetic field and gigantic electric field, and you need to be able to shield the electronics on the inside of the spacecraft to the point where you have to put essentially metallic O-rings almost around any joint to ensure that no field leaks in. So for this, you're talking about using spring-tempered beryllium copper. If you're talking about using that on Earth, if there's ever an arc within an alloy that has beryllium in it, beryllium is poisonous in its... Um, in a gaseous form and you can't use that. So as an alternative, flexible graphite is often used. Okay, other materials available. So now polymers with additives. Well, what type of additives? Oh, the sky can be the limit. So thermoplastics are an example here and they can act as a carrier vehicle to be able to put any number of things in. The carbon fiber we were talking about earlier, you can put those into a polymer, you can put, metallic nanoparticles into them, any number of things. You're now limited by only what you can mold and what you can and what you can then solidify into a part with known dimensions that you can use as a shield. Coated polymers. Uh, these are going to absorb EM rather than reflect it. They're lightweight and they have improved processability. Intrinsically conducting polymers are another option. So when you when you and I think of plastic, we usually think of something that's not conducting. However, there are polymers out there that are conductive. They get that through an alternating double and single conjugated bond set within them. This allows kind of mobility of the different electrons and you can have mobile charge carriers. However, these are not widely deployed due to issues with mechanical and chemical stability. So they're not going to solve all of our problems. New materials and applications are being developed all over the place. Uh, we provide a very nice reference here if anyone finds themselves with some time to go read and kind of see where the state of the art is in terms of all of this. There's a lot of different areas out there that they're breaking it down into. Naturally derived materials for EM shields, thermoset polymers. So thermosets are different from thermoplastics in that a thermoset can be hardened one time and you're done, whereas a thermoplastic can be hardened, melted, hardened, melted, hardened, melted over and over again. Elastomer-based materials, so you're talking about things like uh, gap fillers and rubbers that you impregnate with um, the ability to be able to shield against EMI. Polymeric blends, your thermoplastics, biodegradable polymeric, polymeric materials. So for this, you're talking about, if any of you are familiar with 3D printing, polylactic acid or PLA is biodegradable over a long period. Nanomaterials. Carbon-based reinforced composites, as we mentioned earlier, and chopped fiber composites. Ceramics, cement-based items. When you're talking about curing cement, oftentimes chopped steel is placed into cement and concrete to be able to assist in the curing process. Um, textiles. We are talking about how we're going to be able to protect soldiers from different forms of EM attack, or EM attack either microwave or um, pulsed EM attacks. Building it into uh, textiles is going to be something that we're going to need to address. High temperature EM shields. A lot of work within our country right now is dedicated to being able to stand up a hypersonics defense and a hypersonics offensive weapon system. These things operate at very, very high temperatures. So as a result, we end up having to use things like carbon, carbon and refractory materials to be able to provide the structure with the ability to be able to survive the drag forces and high speeds that it's uh, being fired at. 
you're going to be able to need to shield against DMI against these things or else you're talking about problems with spoofing on these weapon systems or loss of GPS on these weapon systems. <laughs> so upcoming areas, what can we expect to see in terms of our material selection available to be able to shield against DMI? One area is metamaterials. Metamaterials are a very, and I cannot stress that enough, broad category. So this is a ge geometric arrangement of materials resulting in EM properties that are much different than the bulk material. Put a little bit more simply, as you look at this um, figure in the lower right here, it is a lot of different antenna patterns printed in such a way to be able to cause very different electromagnetic behavior to take place than you normally expect for that antenna. Essentially, all these little antenna pieces start acting together rather than as one, and the properties produced are much different than would normally be seen. <clears throat> you can start talking about producing things that have a negative index of refraction at certain free, any number of things. <clears throat> so how do we visualize this? One idea for this to visualize it is a metamaterial can take divergent EMI and focus it to a point in space and act as an electromagnetic lens. Now, that, that doesn't capture the fact that light is also an electromagnetic wave, but we'll, we'll disregard that for one second. Imagine just a normal pair of glasses. These act as a lens to be able to focus light in your eye to be able to better allow you to see. A metamaterial can provide the ability to be able to focus radio waves in a certain way being able to either greatly enhance the strength of said radio wave at a certain point or greatly de-enhance the strength and cause it to dissipate. In other configurations, you can talk about bending different kinds of waves around an object and allowing the items behind the object to emerge in the vision on the first side. This is analogous to a Star Trek type cloaking device. And this has been, dis this has been demonstrated in a limited way already. It's also possible to have a metamaterial where a, an incoming wave is completely blocked, i.e. a perfect beam shield. This would this manifests itself as an invisibility cloak. Um, for some electronic devices, this operates as close to a, the this would allow an EM shield to operate as close to a theoretical perspective as possible. All of these things have been demonstrated to some extent, but have not yet made it into the uh, practical toolbox for the military. <laughs> So metamaterials are also very frequency dependent and can be used for very specific types of antennas or frequency filters. So this allows shielding to be made possible within certain frequency bands, tailored shielding. So one reason to care about that is say you want to be able to talk to a hypersonic missile at a very specific frequency and you don't want it to be able to receive any other messages at any other frequency. So you might be able to use something called the frequency selective surface metamaterial for that. An example of um, two of these kind of things is here. Um, one is a passive design on the um, left there under A. It's a loaded cross-pole design. It allows a resonance at a specific frequency. Another one is a powered active design. So if you see the second image under B there, those are little blue pin um, diodes. This can be turned on and off such that it acts as one type of antenna at one time and another type of antenna at another time. So the off state is shown on the top image here. So you have two different resonance points here and the on image is shown in the bottom. You've effectively removed the second resonance point. Research is progressing in this topic over the different branches of the DOD and NASA to be able to find ways to use these for any number of things. So within metamaterials, like I said, the types of things that, um, the types of them are numerous. There's negative index of refraction materials, single negative materials, hyperbolic materials, which are materi materials that behave as a metal for a certain light polarization and behave as a dielectric for an opposite light polarization, band gap materials, uh, double positive media, biisotropic and bianisotropic and frequency selective surfaces. <clears throat> There's any number of different types of EM applications for these. Um, you're talking about antennas where you can enhance radiative power, frequency, size, and tunability absorbers where you can manipulate the different types of absorption over different frequency spectra, super lenses. Um, these can be 2D or 3D metamaterials with a negative index of refraction that yields um, a negative phase velocity. In this way, it's theoretically possible to allow um, resolution beyond the diffraction limit, almost infinite resolution. Cloaking devices. 
and radar cross sections. One reason why it's important for a radar cross section is you can talk about being able to have a far more aerodynamically favorable um, shape than for a normal radar than for a normal aircraft that involves stealth. Another upcoming area is uh, Maxine's. So these are a 2D organic compound that were first synthesized in 2011 at Drexel University. They're made by chemical modifications of a bulk material to produce this um, layered surface. It's been shown to be scalable and it can be applied to substrates via spray coating. So you can almost imagine taking a um, solution in a spray can with a solvent and some Maxine's and spraying an antenna onto a surface. It's used in optical in optoelectrical devices as a transparent conducting electrode. Um, it has demonstrated surface group dependent superconductivity for niobium carbide, and it can be used as conductive coatings. So in this way, you can imagine developing EM shields where you simply spray on something that you want to shield, and you've shielded it. Another upcoming area is 3D printing shielding. So 3D printing is simply using thermoplastics to be able to act as a delivery mechanism for any number of potential shielding particles. So we're talking about carbon fiber, we're talking about um, metal particles, any number of things. It, the primary um, benefit from 3D printing is just that it can be done much cheaper and much faster than molding plastics. If anyone here has ever had to have molds made and molded plastics, you know it is costly, it can take a while, and Sometimes things don't work and you have to go back. The mold making process is uh, very finicky sometimes. Recent work in 2018 has showed that 3D printed material as an EM shield prototype did work, not quite as effectively as a pressed plastic material, but did demonstrate very good EM shielding. So in addition to that, one of the big advantages of a 3D printing shielding is that you can talk about um, Evolving a 3D printer from just being a 3D printer where it's shown here kind of, you know, printing a single component to being able to mount it and actually contour a print onto some sort of a component that you want shielding for. Talking about almost a patch shield or something like that. You can shield over specific frequency ranges. You can shield over specific components and not over other specific locations. The material is lightweight, it's optimized, and it allows you to have geometric optimization. <clears throat> So this is all great. We've got all these different options available to us in terms of materials and manufacturing. Um, what about the markets for them? So if we go onto the internet and hit Google, you can find there are 377 companies listed under EMI or RFI shielding suppliers. The good news is the robustness of both the global and domestic market allows manufacturers to have a number of different options when imagining shielding designs. The bad news, is things like COVID. And more locally, if like us here in Texas, you can start to talk about local events. An example of that is the 2021 winter storm. So for those of you not in Texas, during February 13th through 17th, Texas experienced one of its worst winter storms in history. And we experienced temperatures below freezing for over 72 hours. For those of you in the north, I can very much understand why you, you look at that and you know think, oh, sure, whatever. In Texas, it's a very different thing because we had a great number of problems with our electric grid, which meant that we had a lot of different facilities shut down. As a result of all that, the freeze in Texas shut down some chemical plants that are used as a part of polymer production. So since then, there has been a number of supply chain issues related to polymer production around the country. This is because of the large concentration of chemical plants around Houston, Texas. In addition, the U.S. depends a great deal on foreign sources for a number of different metals. Metals are the most common type of EM shield. And even when you talk about the different methods you're going to be able to move EM shielding to in the future. So that would be 3D printing EM shields or um, metamaterials. You're still going to need metals for some of that. The biggest importers are Canada, Brazil, South Africa, and China. So shown here, the different types of uh, materials and the different percentage of which is imported into the United States. So for the ones that we have almost 100% import on, you're talking arsenic, asbestos, cesium is important, fluorospar, gallium is important, graphite, indium, manganese, niobium, rare earths, 
All of these are very important to our industrial base. Primary sort major import sources from these first 20 on the left here, 11 are from China. China is going to be, China is one of the countries we are most likely to find ourselves either in military or economic conflict with. We need to be able to make sure that we expand the available markets for our materials, either domestically or internationally, such that we can ensure that we have markets open to us to allow us to be able to effectively fight wars. So in conclusion, much of the U.S. material military arsenal now contains integrated electronic components. The industrial, civilian, and military infrastructures are intimately tied together and both and all need to be protected from unwanted EM and EMI. So wrapped up within the existing and upcoming requirements for new weapon systems, we need to ensure that R&D into new weapons, existing materials, and new engineering methodologies are continuing to be made available. These new materials and methodologies will continue to allow protecting civilian and infrastructure in military infrastructure, holding near peer adversaries at bay and allowing US forces to leverage our own military superiority. And with that, thank you very much for all of you listening. I greatly appreciate it. Awesome, thanks Doyle. Good, uh, great presentation, great delivery. Um, uh, we did have a couple questions come through, so I'm going to go ahead and present them, uh, reread them for those who are just listening, and then uh, yourself or Richard or Megan can uh, respond accordingly. So here we go. First one came through. Uh, I guess one's probably the, one of the more specific ones came through. But how much power can a Burke Pulsar produce in order to be effective at range? I will be honest. I would require me to go back and do <laughs> dig up more research on that. I also don't know what range Mr. Mazurik is um, mentioning there. There's RDECOM presentations available on the internet regarding this, and it may be possible to uh, contact RDECOM to be able to get more answers regarding that. Yep. Actually, this is a good opportunity to plug uh, DSIX TI Research Service, Technical Inquiry Research Service. So, Mike, if you, have a, if you wanted to submit that as a question to DSI, we'd be happy to dig up some information and help get that answer, that specific answer to, to your technical question for you. All right, good enough. Uh, so next question. This is just for curiosity, for the example of India-China microwave attacks on personnel, what is the effective range of those systems? That's gonna be another question that I don't know the answer to. It's going to depend. It's going to depend on a number of things, which is probably going to involve what those particular systems are capable of and the um, the location it's being deployed in. It may. It's it's like everything else. If you deploy it potentially in a valley, it may not be very effective outside the valley. If you deploy it in an open field, you may have a much longer range. In addition to that, there's been a great deal of rumors and hearsay regarding that attack. Some people say it happened. Some people say it didn't happen. So the truth, the truth is out there somewhere, but it's a still it's being debated in a lot of different circles. Fair enough. Thanks. All right. Next question it says for the state of the art shielding material section, why is it advantageous to be able to magnetize and demagnetize easily? Uh, <clears throat> well, we're talking about uh, ferromagnetic materials, and if you want it to be soft, then uh, that is, in other words, it doesn't become permanently magnetized. A lot of ferromagnets, you put them in a magnetic field, you take them out, and now they're magnetic. And for something that you want to use as a core in a transformer, as an example, you don't want it to store magnetism because that just is a way to lose energy because then in the next cycle, you're trying to push it and it wants to stay magnetized in one polarization. So for things to be really advan advantageous to um, either manipulate magnetic fields or to shield again them, you want them to be soft as magnets. And so that, that was kind of the easily demagnetized uh, phrase that we were using. Uh, in physics, it's referred to as a soft ferromagnet because it doesn't hold the magnetism. Very good. Thank you. 
And that was, to be clear, that was Richard, correct? Yes. Yep. Thanks, Richard. All right. Uh, next question, just more generally, do you have any insight into the Havana syndrome, waveform or frequency, anything like that? Waveform, no. If you're talking about the Havana syndrome, you're also going to want to be able to effectively penetrate beyond just the external skin of someone. That way you could do the damage that they believe that has been done to those people. Mm -hmm. Um I imagine that a great deal of the information on that is being uh, kept closely guarded right now and will be for some time. It'll be very classified. Yeah, okay. that's, that's if they if they happen to have a detector around to even pick it up and know what it is. I, I haven't heard anything um, along those lines right now. It's just a suspicion. All right, and that's that's fair enough. Uh, I think you're right too. We have to be careful. We wouldn't get in any classified discussion in this forum. All right. Uh, the next question here: What's the best shield for quantum computers against cosmic radiation? Mm. <sighs> Ultimately, if you're talking about ensuring that no cosmic, no charged particle damage hits your computer, a, I would say a big, giant, thick piece of metal. Well, um, when I was at UT, we had a uh, spectrometer with an electronic detector in the basement. And every so often, a cosmic ray would come through and you would get this huge spike. And I had to keep explaining to the students, that's not a real spectral line. That's a cosmic ray. Um, and what I found effective was having an eight story building above me. <laughs> the, the answer to this, unfortunately, is lots of material mass and mass that is impractical to launch along with any cosmic computer that may go into space or something like that and be subjected to a great deal of cosmic radiation. <laughs> hence, the, hence the reason why materials research for this continues. That's right. All right, good. Appreciate it. Thanks. Next question about the uh, invisibility cloak we mentioned. Have metamaterials been used for visible light invisibility cloaks to bend the light around objects? In, in uh, radio frequency, I think they have. Yeah. yeah. Visible, they're working on it, but mm -hmm. they've got a ways to go. You're talking about for visible light, you're talking about terahertz frequencies versus um, gigahertz frequencies for radio. And it's a lot easier to operate lower frequencies. As you get into higher frequencies, most of your equipment goes up considerably in cost. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good point. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, Long-ish one says, within, meta within metamaterial specifically, have any demonstrated properties that would allow directionally selective shielding, especially within selected frequencies? In other words, we can filter out 2.35 to 2.45 gigahertz inbound, but allow it outbound. Hmm. That's a very good question. Um, if the um, I'm sure I, it can if, be done. If the author wouldn't mind, I if he would if. He can email that. I know someone who might be able to provide a more um, educated answer than myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's fair. And I, could, I, could, I, mean, I could imagine. I could imagine specifically for that one. Um, for that one slide that we showed, where we were showing two different um, resonances within a frequency selective surface, you can filter it. Um, inbound for a certain point and then allow it to go outbound by turning on the other portion of the antenna. But I imagine you'd also like it to permanently be filtering that one particular um, frequency band inbound, so. Okay, well, and I'll plug again the technical, oh, the inquiry research service. So if there's a, this particular question, Don, if you want to submit it to DSI between the folks we have in-house and of course all those from Tri Austin supporting us, we can help get your answer to this. 
All right, uh, next question is if you could comment on the Boeing Champ. Let's see. I know I know for a much more intelligent discussion on Boeing Champ, if I can plug our state of the art report coming out in the next few months, we will have a section regarding Champ, how it's being used and what the implications behind it are. Huh. That's good. Good teaser for the uh, upcoming report. <laughs> we try. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question says, can you talk about directed energy weapons against drones and how to protect against them? With drones, it's going with, with drones. It becomes difficult simply because of the fact that drones need to be as lightweight as can be made due to the fact that you're trying that a great deal of the mass of a drone is essentially parasitic mass. And by that, I mean the batteries. So you're talking about, you can't just throw a giant piece of metal out in front of the drone and be able to expect any degree of functional operation and have functional EM shielding. What you're probably going to be looking at is some sort of metamaterial based um, shield for that. That way you can leverage the fact that now you're going from a big piece of metal to some essentially PCBs or a 3D printed shield of some kind so as to be able to protect against certain frequencies while not turning your drone into a giant EM shield that has a flight time of 30 seconds. <laughs> All right, good point. All right, we've got uh, two more questions in queue currently. Second to last one here says, would you care to give any insights or guesses on Havana syndrome? And could we design a shielding without knowing the specifics of the source? And of course, you already commented a bit on the Havana syndrome, so maybe the better focus could be on the latter part of that question of design a shielding without knowing the specifics of the source. To some extent, you can start talking about that because you can talk about the different frequencies and, and what wavelengths those correspond to that are going to interact with different pieces of the human body. It gets broken down a little bit more into are you talking about, for, the, for this, the Havana syndrome, I believe, is, the, is an attack on the human brain. And so you're now talking about the human brain in its entirety and then the different pieces of the human brain, and then potentially different subsections of that. That can kind of bound your problem to some extent, because now you're talking about frequencies and wavelengths that can interact with those. And you can talk about building certain kinds of shields for that. Now, if you're talking about, it's also a function of actually where the attack is happening. Depend if it's happening inside of a if it's happening while a person is sitting within a U.S. building or something like that, you can talk about any number of ways to be able to put shielding in that way. If you're talk if that attack is happening while this person is no longer in a U.S. building or is moving in the open, and we can't see it, the depending on what the shielding solution is, that may not be practical. A more practical idea for something like that might be development of some kind of a detector. That way a person would know when they're being subjected to an attack. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of the um, information available about a, the Havana syndrome is necessary, is in some cases conjecture. And so it's difficult to be able to intelligently respond about that just because of the nature of the attack and the mm -hmm. fact that a lot of it is being kept secret at this time and what is out there isn't necessarily the most reliable. So okay. apologies. All good. All right, we did have a couple of questions uh, come through, uh, additional questions come through as you were responding to that. So we'll, we'll carry it forward if that's all right. Next question was, can you further discuss work being done on 3D printing shielding? What type of materials, what printers? I don't know about the particular printers. I know that the types of materials are involving different types of thermoplastics that are being impregnated with different types of metallic particles. 
Um, and, gra and graphenes, thank you. So for common materials being used as 3D printer materials for commercially available printers, you can talk about PLA, ABS, PETG. There's a number of different ones out there that are now easily available by just going to Amazon and buying the material. If you're talking about stuff that you can actually impregnate, you need to be able to get it in a certain form such that you can then impregnate it into. So that's either going to be pellets or it's going to be a powder that you can then mix and, uni and um, uniformly disperse whatever you're shielding insert or shielding additive is going to be if it's going to be graphene if it's going to be some kind of a metallic particle if it's going to be a nanoparticle if it's going to be carbon fiber i will say i will say this we've um <clears throat> done a little bit of work with um manufacturing um filament in house if you want to be able to ensure that your filament can has the appropriate um, volume fraction or something like that of your additive, you probably need to make it in-house versus going out and buying it commercially. They sell copper, for example, they sell copper filled um, filament that's available to make just, just do normal 3D printing, but you can't necessarily guarantee the copper volume fraction in there. They put enough in to be able to achieve the color and the density that they want, but they don't necessarily put in any more after that. And so if, you're talking about needing an infill to a certain volume fraction. You want to be able to make sure that your source is going to give you that. And Amazon or something like that isn't necessarily going to provide you with uh, the answer you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, next question. Uh, what lightweight materials can be used for EMI on high voltage electrified propulsion systems? I, I would say that that is a very good candidate for a uh, technical inquiry. <laughs> yeah, that, sound, that, sound, that sounds like there's a there's a number of things that should be researched there to be able to provide a good answer. Right, hard to just spitball it right on one spot, right? Alas, yes. Okay, no, no, no worries. All right, next question: um, Active adaptive cloaking technology is it possible? Or, I'm sorry, active adaptive coating technology for cloaking. People are studying uh, cuttlefish, is it called? Because they're, they're the only oh. cuttlefish that can do it dynamically. So, is this like a kind of chameleon effect or something like that? That's why I'm because, it, because, because there was an article recently published, and by recently, I mean probably two weeks ago, describing how a research team had gone through and produced a chameleon effect for the first time okay. in the lab. Dynamically, yes. So you can imagine a little lizard walking on a um, blue background, transitioning to a red background, transitioning to a white background, and it changing colors as it did that. Ah, okay. So possible, yes. In fact, demonstrated it, perhaps. And if I misinterpreted the question, I apologize. Nope, you sounds exactly right. We got a, a comment back here from Gerd uh, confirming that you interpreted it correctly. So all good. Excellent. Very good. Except he's saying, he, just a clarification, he's saying he would be interested in the, the analogy of now colors translating to EMI. I that I would not be able to comment intelligently upon that. Apologies. <laughs> sure. All right. Well, hey, um, that's the last of the questions that we have. Um, I will just comment. We did a couple of questions come in just about the webinar presentation itself. Uh, again, it's available on our website, the DSIAC website. It is being recorded, and we're going to send a link out to all the attendees tomorrow, probably where you can get that. It'll be uh, on our YouTube page or directly accessible through our website. So um, if you do have any challenges finding that, please contact somebody with DSIAC, Doyle, Richard, Megan, whoever you'd like to, and we can, we can help get that to you. But um, appreciate everybody joining in so far. And of course, Doyle, Megan, Richard for the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. We appreciate it. All right. Take care. You too.